Hey guys, welcome back to uh, another composer interview. Today we got composer Bruce Broughton with us today. Yes, you do. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm Bruce Broughton. I'm a composer. I uh, probably best know for doing a lot of movies and TV things, some theme parks, um, a little bit of everything. Now I do a lot of concert works, so I'm still composing and um, having a really good time. So, but I don't think I think we're going to be talking about old stuff, right? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. It's still out there. I sort of took the long route. Uh, I grew up in a musical family, which should have made it easy. I started taking piano lessons when I was a little kid. And then I started taking trumpet lessons. My brother was a trombone player. Both my parents could read music, could play the piano, could play brass instruments. I had a grandfather who was a composer, an uncle who was a songwriter, um, an aunt who was a, a pianist. So I had music all around me, but what I wanted to do when I was a kid was to be an animator, you know, for um, animation. So Walt Disney was my hero. And although I took piano lessons and I got good as a classical pianist, um, being a composer never really occurred to me. I, I started writing some music when I was about 12 or 13, and I kept that going, but I didn't think of it as a profession. So when I got into college, I eventually got into music um, only because I thought that if I if I got a degree, by the time I got my degree, I'd probably know what I wanted to do, <laughs> but I didn't. Uh, so I had a degree in music composition and um, I was driving, so I was, you know, I was thinking, well, okay, so now I'm, I've got this degree, I should get into music. But I didn't know what kind of music I wanted to get into. So I'm driving, I was like in my early 20s, um, driving down the road one time, listening to some music, listening to some songs, you know, pop songs. and. Um, I was getting excited and I was bouncing around. I thought, you know, I think that's what I'd like to do. I'd like to write music that makes people feel like that thing, that song makes me feel really good. And I thought, well, what kind of music should that be? And I thought about songwriting and I thought, no, that's too short because those things are only about three or four minutes long. I'd like to write music of some length and some variety and that's emotional. And I thought, oh, movies. Uh, you know, movies, you get people in a dark room and, and uh, the music is playing and, and uh, it's all emotional, it's dramatic. So I'm going to see if I can get in the movies. So little by little, um, I actually a few months after I got out of college, I got a job working for CBS television in the music department, which doesn't exist anymore. This is a long time ago, I mean, a really long time ago. And um, so I worked there for about 10 years on staff, not as a composer, but as really part of the manager. I, I hired the management. I ended up being manager of the department, ended up being assistant director of music for CBS. And um, it was mostly uh, the doing the nuts and the bolts of the business, like hiring orchestras and composers and, and um, uh, contracts, uh, taking part in negotiations with the union, you know, all that kind of stuff, learning about licensing, which was actually really good for me. But my real job uh, was as a, I mean, the reason I got hired was to be a music supervisor, which was um, a fancy name for what was actually a cue selector, meaning that CBS produced a whole bunch of shows like Gunsmoke and Hawaii Five-0 and Wild Wild West. And they had they had just been doing um, uh, like Twilight Zone and things like that. They had, a, you know, they, they did a lot of shows. and. We would hire composers, we, CBS, would hire composers to do maybe half the season, which would be about 12 shows. And then from the music that those composers would write, that would go into the library. And then the music supervisors, the cue selectors, people like me, would go through that music and track or, or place that music in subsequent episodes. So I learned, I learned pretty quickly how to play music with picture and, and dramatically. And then while I was there, I started doing my own shows uh, first of all, by doing cues that we like sometimes if we were tracking a show, we might find that we there was one cue that was so unique, we really didn't have anything like that. So one of us would write that and put it on the end of another session. And gradually I did more and more of that. And then I got my own shows. And when I realized that I was not going to become a music manager, which was really a bad idea um, for me anyway, um, I decided to leave CBS and I went freelance and started working in television. So I started working immediately in shows like um, like Quincy, which is an old show, and um, all these shows were old shows. I'd, so anyway, I'd, so I did several years of television episodes. I did things like Dallas, 
I did westerns, I did sci-fi things, I did uh, cop shows, um, soap operas. Uh, I eventually ended up doing some animation shows like Tiny Toons. Um, the TV movies, did miniseries, did one about the Civil War, and then I got into movies. And once I got into movies, I was sort of a movie composer, but I, I kept doing television when I could because I always liked it. Because it was fast and people weren't looking over my shoulders as much as they were on movies. So, um, uh, doing the movies, I ended up doing um, some theme park things for Disney, which was really great. I really enjoyed that. I always enjoyed the animation stuff. When I got a chance to do Rescuers Down Under, which was a full feature at Disney, I said immediately, said, yeah, I'll do it. You know, I'd be happy. They didn't think that, I mean, a lot, of, a lot of movie composers at that point didn't like doing animation, but I did, because that was what I really wanted to do. And to think that I was going to do an animated film for Disney was really, you know, really great. I was not, I had already given up my ambitions to be an animator, which is really a good idea because when I saw how good those guys were, <laughs> I was not anywhere in that league, but I was a good composer and I could do that. So I, um, so I had a lot of fun doing a lot of different things, a lot of different kinds of music. And now looking back on it, um, uh, the thing I remember is mostly working with a lot of different people, um, even whatever problems I thought I was having at the time, right now kind of go into the dustbin of history because I really worked with a lot of interesting people and a lot of different projects. Uh, we were always doing live music, which meant that we were always working with orchestras and, and musicians. Um, so, I, did, you know, it, I mean, it was just like a boy in a candy store. It, it, uh, it worked out really well and it still, still works out really well. I still really enjoy writing music and getting it performed and meeting people, you know, who are going to do this or need music or whatever. So it's been a, you know, it's been a good run. Right. Long answer. I have long answers to your short questions. <laughs> now, writing for strings is not simplistic. You can write simply for strings. Uh, there's a lot of music that's very simple, particularly music for beginners, and, you know, junior high and all that kind of stuff. And there are some uh, there are a lot of concert pieces by Mozart and Haydn and, and, you know, more contemporary composers that is not very hard to play. But writing for strings is not simplistic. If you want it to sound good, you've got to know what you're doing. Now, it's true that strings have a lot of overtones. They're very rich in overtones. And the one thing that strings do pretty naturally is they tend to, um, they tend to balance well, even if their numbers aren't exactly correct. But um, no, you have to know, I, I know a lot of people who write really badly for strings. And um, no, I wouldn't say there's anything simplistic about that at all. Um, I wouldn't think that writing any kind of music is simplistic. Some people do it easier than others. Like these days, because things are, um, there are a lot of electronic things, people can work on their, um, on their synthesizers and all that kind of stuff. It's not necessary to read music in order to compose music. You can just sit down and play it, and there's a, there's usually software that will notate it for you. And somebody who can read that stuff can write it out and clean it up and make it make make it possible for other people to read it. But um, that's pretty basic composing, you know. Um, and it goes all the way from stupid to kind of interesting. Um, no, I don't think there's anything simplistic about music. I mean, if, if you're trying to do something really good, like I'll tell you something that, that people underestimate is, um, is the value of a good tune. Now, tunes are not real popular. Even in pop music, they're not real popular right now. Um, I, I hear some pop music where you can hear people doing different kinds of melodies. So I think, you know, some of that is, some of that is starting to change. But people think um, if it's a really good, good tune, uh, it just sort of came to you, like, you know, God came and whispered a little tune in your ear and you write it down and, hey, that it took me two minutes to write this tune. Sometimes that happens. Sometimes that happens. And sometimes it happens to people who are not trained musicians. But to write a good melody, uh, that's not so easy. You know, it's not so easy. Even the stuff that sounds simplistic uh, is not so easy. Like, here's a tune that's really easy. That's the Tiny Tunes theme. That's a pretty easy little tune. Um, it wasn't real hard to write. Um, 
but I had to get an idea for it first. That's that's the tricky part, getting the idea. And then once I had the tune, I had to develop it because it needed to be a certain length. It needed to be a real tune. And once I finished it, it was kind of bland. It just sort of sat there. And um, I couldn't figure out why, because I had done it right, but it was just boring. And um, so then I tried this. I changed key. Well, so then every every couple of bars I changed key and all of a sudden the tune became kind of kind of cool. You know, it was kind of cartoony, and all that stuff. And, and it, um, it ended up being popular and, and worked really well for the show. But it didn't just take me two minutes to sit down and write the thing out. I mean, the, the original theme, the original theme, as I said, was pretty dull. And um, even though it's basically all in the, the finished version, I had to sit there and being a create, being a composer who's trained, had to figure out what tools I had at my disposal to make it better. So, you know, simplistic isn't a isn't a word I would use for anything having to do with composing or writing for any group of instruments. Take lessons, read a lot of music, listen to a lot of music, and write a lot of music. Just practice, practice, practice. And in the in the writing of it, try to get your stuff played. Um, and it doesn't matter what instrument you're working on. If you're writing on a guitar or a piano or a saxophone, or if you have friends who is a clarinet player, maybe a flute player and a violinist, write a piece for them. You know, write a piece for a combination like that and have it get played. And then learn about the instruments. Learn about what the what the range is, learn about how the instrument changes when it's, when it, the, the sound of the instrument changes when it's playing low as opposed to how it plays high. Um, string instruments are pretty gnarly instruments to, to learn, you know, they've got different strings, all the instruments are, are different and the strings all sound slightly different and to make them sound really good isn't just a matter of drawing the bow across the string, it's, you know, it's where you place the notes and what note goes before and what note goes after and then the combination of all the other stuff. It's pretty, um, it's pretty challenging. And when you're young, um, you know, you have a lot of creative ideas and you have a lot of energy and that's really the best time to start learning this kind of stuff. And learn to play some instruments, learn to play two or three instruments. Like I, I learned to play piano, I was a good pianist. But in my family, I had to learn to play, to play a brass instrument, so I played French horn too. Never as good as the piano. The piano was my best instrument. Um, but everybody in my family played at least two instruments. My wife is a violinist. She plays the piano. Um, you know, I mean, it's, it's just as a composer, you want to be able to do as much as possible, but it's really important to listen. If you don't have anything else than, than a record or a recording, it's really great. But the best thing to do is go listen to live music. It doesn't matter whether it's jazz or, or pop music or classical music or concert music, whether it's for quartets or orchestras or singers, whatever it is, just go listen to them just so you so you can identify what the instruments you know you're sitting there and you're hearing something oh yeah that's a cool sound who did that so you look in the auction and you see this guy doing blah 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 and you go oh i think that's a trombone i mean i'm gonna see if i can hear that you know and then you start to pay attention to what that guy does or woman or whatever, whoever plays it um that's the way you actually start to learn you have to build up a memory of the sounds so that then you can start to put them together in your own combinations and be original but at the beginning, you end up copying a lot of people, and that's that's no big deal. When you uh, you try to write a piece like um, I don't know, like if you're a songwriter, try to write a piece, try to write a song as good as Irving Berlin or George Gershwin or Paul McCartney or, or I don't know, Cher. I mean, just try to write something that's like that, and if you can do that successfully, then start working on your own things. I mean, you you usually start by copying other people. I mean, they all do. Everybody. Does that. It really helps to have somebody for a while anyway to help you get started and kind of show you the way, you know, who can answer some basic questions. You know, doing movies and television and theme parks and all that kind of stuff is, is um, I'll use that as an example. That's kind of like a very specific kind of music. Um, you're doing a Western, you're doing a space show, you're doing a soap opera. They sort of have sounds, you know, and there's certain uh, certain instruments that are identified with Westerns, like guitars, harmonicas, uh, maybe bugles or, you know, something like that. When you're doing that kind of music, you try to find music that helps represent the story that you're trying to tell emotionally. When you're just writing a piece of music, or even in a song, 
you're trying to get something, some musical background that helps the words, helps the music, you know, that's going to help tell your story. If it's a country piece, if it's a pop piece, if it's a hip hop piece, there are sort of instruments that you associate with these styles. Certainly with jazz, there's certain instruments you associate with these styles. So sometimes you would you would pick those instruments, but you know, sometimes styles get crossbred too. No, I, I have been prepared to write for anything and particularly doing movies and things. Sometimes I'd have to write for instruments that I really didn't, had never written for, like maybe ethnic instruments. One of the things I did in the Disney parks is called soaring. It was, um, I did, there were two of them. The first one was done by Jerry Goldsmith and the second one was done by me using a lot of Jerry's themes and things like that. But the show's completely different and, and part of what we're soaring over is the Great Wall of China. So I use some Chinese instruments just to give a, give a feeling of where we are as opposed to being over a waterfall in South America, you know. And even then, I mean, there's some other scenes where we were in Africa, we're here or there in Agnesa. For each of those, um, I very often will use some instrument that's associated with that kind of music. Well, sometimes you have to study because I don't know that much about Chinese music. And I remember I had a real Chinese woman violinist play violin, the Chinese violin. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, I, if I asked just a regular violin, like my wife to play it, she wouldn't know how to play it because it's, you know, it's an ethnic instrument. But I found somebody who played it really well. You have to figure out how to write for it and what kind of flutes to use and, and what the little turns are and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, you're always learning, you know, so what's your favorite instrument? I don't have one. I really don't have one. I like them all when they're, when they're working well. And if I wrote something for it, I like them even better when I wrote really well for it. If I write really stupid for it, then I don't like it so much. <laughs> but then I have to learn more, you know. First of all, you have to look at the movie. It, it's it's more important actually than reading the script. Because if you read the script, all the script tells you is what happens. Uh, it doesn't tell you anything about the actors, who the actors are, how the scenes are actually performed. It doesn't tell you how funny it is or how scary it is or anything. It just sort of tells you this happens, that happens. So when you see the movie, you get an idea of one, what it's actually about and how different it is and how unique it is. And then you sit and you, you sit with the director or the producer, whoever's in charge, and you decide where the movie's going to go. These are called music spotting sessions. You're spotting the musical spots to put music. And the conversation goes sort of like this. I mean, you'll, you'll sit and say, okay, let's start the music after she says, I'm never going to see you again, and, you know, walks out. So the music's going to start just a beat after that. And let's take the music the whole way until, um, until the car shows up in the driveway and, and she gets out of the car. And so the director or the producer will say, yeah, that's, that really works for me. Or um, he might say, he or she might say, why don't we take it until she actually gets into the house? Because that, that's a long walk from the car to the house and there's nothing going on. And they go, oh, okay, we can do that. So, I mean, you go through the whole movie and you do that for every piece of music. It could be 30, 40 pieces of music. They're, they call them cues that you're going to put in the movie. Or what happens is you're looking at the movie and you realize that the movie is really well done, but it has one thing that isn't really clear. Um, there's a uh, there's an element in it that's I mean, for sake of conversation, let's just say it's a um, it's a supernatural element. Okay, there's a little supernatural thing going on in the film, and every time that happens in this movie that you're looking at that doesn't have music or sound effects yet, it sort of falls flat because. It's more a feeling than it is an actual object. So you start to think, well, music could help that. Music could help that. And so when you get together with the producer or the director and you start talking about what the music is, and, and you, know, you might say to him or her, look, I mean, I think your movie works really well and it doesn't need a lot of music, but there is one area where I think we can probably help it a lot, and it's in that supernatural thing, to make it really creepy, you know? <clears throat> and then you talk about that. Well, there's a love affair involved too, so it's like a creepy love affair, and uh, you know, and there's it's like a like three people instead of two people, except one of them is dead, and you have blah 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 and all that kind of stuff. So you say, oh, yeah, that, that looks pretty interesting. So when those scenes come up, you find that that's more the music that you're playing. So this movie that is basically just a, a, a sort of a romance has this spooky supernatural part in it, and you find out that's essentially the kind of music that you're going to be writing for this movie. So even though, even though it looks like basically just a basic movie, it will just take music for whatever. 
you find that you're just playing really something really very special. And um, I mean, even in, in Westerns, um, like I did two Westerns, one was Silverado and the other one was Tombstone. Um, they both took place in around the same time, I guess, in like the late 19th century. One was actually a biography. Um, but the movies are very, very, very different. I mean, very, very, very different. One is very well thought out with the good guys, bad guys, very much like a traditional old Western, um, which is what it was supposed to be. And the other one is this um, way over the top, emotional, um, melodramatic thing about the about the Earp brothers and the gunfight of the OK Corral and all that kind of stuff. Very different. If you So if you take the music from one of those films and you take the music from the other film and you compare them, they're very different. Now, they're both Westerns, but the music's really different, you know, because this music goes for that movie, the really melodramatic one, and this one goes for that one, which is the good guys and the bad guys, and they have friends and they have people doing nice things with each other as well as shooting each other like they do in Westerns. And the other one, everybody's a bad guy, you know, and, and you know, so the music changes a lot, and um, it really depends on what you're doing. Oh, okay, so you, your question wasn't about that. So when I figure out what the music, sorry, I get carried away. Um, so when I figure out what what the story is that I'm going to tell with the music, so I'll sit and I'll think about it, and, and basically the question I ask myself is, how do I feel about that? What would I, what would I, what kind of music would get that feeling that I needed a supernatural thing or the over the top Western, you know, what kind of a theme would play that? And then I'll start to get an idea. It may be four or five notes, maybe just the beginning of something, but it's something that I'll start to work with. It comes right from the feeling. And then after I get, after I get my theme worked out, then because I, do, I can use any combination of instruments that I, that I want, depending upon the budget, I start saying, okay, what combinations would be that I could use to express that in the best way. Is this going to have strings? If so, I'm going to have violins and violas and cellos and basses. Or maybe, will I just do it with, how about just using basses? Like how, oh, I like eight basses, because that's very different than having violins and it's very, oh, very dark. Like I said. For instance, I, I was on a recording session years when I still worked at CBS many years ago, and we, were, we had a Western that was being recorded by, um, Bernard Herrmann, who was a very famous film composer. Bernard Herrmann was, was very famous for um, using musical color to tell his story. So at CBS, one of the things we had with our orchestra is we only had 18 people in the orchestra. You could use any combination you wanted, but you couldn't go over 18, right? So his 18-piece orchestra were six contrabasses, the big, you know, the big double basses, six bassoons, and then six bass clarinets. So the whole the whole orchestra was anyway, and it was it was really confusing. It was so dark and it was so muddy. There was no theme in it. Um, it was just the sound of this mud. I could never figure it out. And after the after the session was over, <coughs> I didn't see it with the picture, but I I would go back to that music and take out the scores and look at it and try to figure out why he did that you know it's so weird so then i asked one of the producers of that show several months later i said hey what was that score like that you got from bernard herman how did that work for you and he said you know that was the best score we had all year and i said really yeah he said because you know it was a really dark show it was like about a um um jack the ripper kind of a guy and we needed some dark music and man that music was really dark and I thought yeah man in that case Bernard Herman really got it right you know because he <laughs> it wasn't the big beautiful theme it wasn't like you know some romantic thing it was about a killer a really serious thing it was really dark really scary so he found the right instruments you know to do that for what he wanted to, to play and um, I'm sure he did it the same way as I did I mean you just sit there and say how do I feel about this what's gonna be the best way of expressing this that I'm going to write, you know. So, it all come. It, it always comes from a feeling, you know. It, it's just how do I? I mean, do I feel happy about this? Or, or like the Tiny Toons theme? I mean, I knew what kind of a show that was. It was a cartoon show, and it was supposed to be like the old Warner Brothers shows. So, I knew sort of the style, but I needed something that was going to do, you know. And then I got the idea for that and was able to write it up. 
These themes and motifs are usually associated with elements in the movie. A really good example of how this works is the movie Jaws. When you hear boom, 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 that's the, that's the shark. And if you hear it and you don't see the shark, you figure the shark is around. When you hear that, you just think shark. Well, actually, those that two note theme doesn't mean anything. It's just bop, 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 you know, but we associate it with that particular thing. A lot of orchestras um, during the summers have their pop concerts and they play movie themes. What these people do as they're listening to these themes, just listening to the themes, they recall the movie. Like there, a movie that I did is called Homeward Bound. It's about two dogs and a cat. It's a very big family film. And even now I get letters from people who watched it 20 years ago or, or something and, and they remember the themes and if they hear the theme, they just sort of come apart. Oh, that's sassy, oh, that's, you know, blah, 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 blah because that theme was so associated with those characters. As the theme gets gets associated with the character, let's say two thirds of the way through the movie when the theme has been used a lot, you can use the theme and it will bring the memory of somebody back, even though that person isn't in the scene. Maybe like if you have a boyfriend or a girlfriend and you've got a really tight relationship, you have a favorite song. And every time you hear that song, oh, that's our song. That was the song that was playing the first time I ever saw her or the first time I ever saw him or whatever. Uh, so you use the same sort of thing in music. It's all done by association. No, I, I mean, I actually, a lot of them I can't play all the way through. <laughs> a, there's so many of them. They were all written for specific things, for specific movies. I mean, I, there, there are a lot of the themes that I like, just as themes. None of them would have been written without the movie. I'm happy they're around. It made me think that maybe I should have been a songwriter, because I, I, if I had been a songwriter, maybe I would have been writing some really good songs. I don't know. Well, you tend not to get writer's block because you're on a deadline. Overthinking it, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I'm a really good overthinker. One of the things that, that's interesting about this kind of work is that you're, you're never writing for yourself. You're always writing for somebody else. If you're in a movie, you're basically writing for the director and you're getting all your creative um, instructions from the director. Um, everybody's different and they all hear music, they all feel music differently. Sometimes on a, on a scene, uh, a director say, well, that's not funny. You know, I, I'm not laughing. I, I, it needs to be funny. Well, that's pretty scary to hear, you know, because then you don't know anything about this guy's sense of humor. People laugh at different things. I mean, does he like physical comedy, verbal comedy, or situation? I mean, you know, what is it, you know? Or somebody says, it's not scary enough, or it's too scary, or it's, it's romantic, but it's too romantic. You know, I mean, like, what's too romantic or, you know, that kind of stuff. So you have to figure out what suits the person that you're working for. So, yeah, you can overthink it. If you've worked with somebody several times, then you have a, a pretty good idea. It's like a, it's sort of like a dating relationship. You know, you sort of know uh, what you're going to be talking about, what you're going to be doing and, and uh, how you can bring up things. If it's brand new, um, not so sure. I mean, they're not so sure of you. You're not so sure of them. Everybody wants to do a good job. But yeah, you can overthink it and you can underthink it too. I mean, one time, and I'd worked with the director before, and he told me before before we did this movie, he told me exactly what he wanted. He said, uh, if you want to hear your music, I want to hear my effects. So I, I want, and then he said the kind of music that he wanted, you know, for that. And I overthought it. I thought, oh, well, what he really means is blah, 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 blah. So I did something that he didn't want. And he said, I'm not, I don't, I don't like any of this stuff. I, you know, I told you what I wanted and I realized he had, he had told me exactly what he wanted. And so I had to rewrite it along the lines of what he had told me the first time. Now with somebody else, what I had done may have worked just fine saying, oh, what he means is so-and-so because a lot of directors don't, don't know anything about music. So they get confused and intimidated talking to a composer. But this guy knew enough. I mean, he knew exactly what he wanted and he knew it when I stepped over the line. So that one, yeah, I would have thought. You basically go with your own feelings. I mean, I've heard even Hans Zimmer say this. Uh, Hans was one of the big, it was like Inception or something, one of the big movies. And they'd been working on the score and the studio hadn't seen it, the director hadn't seen it. And he was, he was nervous. You know, he was really nervous because he, he hoped that he got it right. And fortunately, they liked it. You know, he thought it was just really great and all that kind of stuff. But it, it relieved him. I mean, I, we're all like, all like that. I mean, I've seen some really good composers, some really famous composers get very nervous when they're recording.
You read out your music. Well, anyway, it's a, oh, that's not gonna work. What I was gonna show you is just my sketch paper, the stuff where I write the basic to go. And then I was gonna show you some of my score paper, which is writing it out for the orchestra. Because I'm basically an acoustical guy. I, I do I do synth stuff, but I tend not to write that stuff out when I'm doing it with all the instruments. So uh, you write that out that big score for, you know, if you get a 60 piece orchestra, an 80 piece orchestra, and then that music is sent to the copyists who have to take take all those notes down and give them to the flute part and the, the trumpet and the cello and all those things that you've written out already. And then you assemble for a recording, which is the best part of making a movie, frankly. I mean, I think everybody thinks it's the best part. Because you get in this big recording stage, and particularly if you have an orchestra, it's really exciting. Like a guy who likes, who, on a TV show, to me, he uses way too many instruments, but he likes it, and he's a really good musician, it doesn't really matter, is Seth MacFarlane. Seth, um, on, on the Orville, he likes big orchestras. So on his, on, on the Orville, um, the guys who are working on that will work with like 70, 80, almost 100 people. He's had like 95, 96 mm -hmm. people. So that's a lot, you know, for a TV show. Yeah. It's a lot for a movie. But he just loves that kind of stuff. So then you get all this stuff. And now all of a sudden, it's really cool because you get to see the movie come alive. You show the picture. The music is in synchronization with the picture. You've worked out all the timings and all that kind of stuff. And then you play the music and, you know, suddenly the actors are more heroic and, and the battles are more exciting or the love scenes are sexier and all those other kind of stuff. It's really great. And it's... Um, and when it works well, and it usually works well, um, the, the people in charge, like the producer, the directors, I mean, they're so, they're so happy because now they're seeing their film come together in the way that it was supposed to be done. Uh, when, you're, when you're just seeing it without music, it's kind of a cold thing. But when you see it with the, all the music, you know, it's great. And then the thing is that, that all that music that you did on the recording stage has to be mixed in with the dialogue and with the sound effects. So there's nothing, there's nothing in the soundtrack that's more important than dialogue. dialogue can never be covered. You have to hear every word. That's, that's sort of a written rule, unwritten rule. Um, so the music and the sound effects sort of compete, sometimes in a friendly way, sometimes in a not so friendly way. You know, if I can't hear my French horns, well, I can't hear my wish expect. You know, no. <laughs> sometimes people are yelling at each other, all that kind of stuff. But, but the director decides which one he wants. And, and you know, sometimes in order to get this, the scene to play well, um, sometimes the sound effect is better than the music. You know, it's just, you want the sense of realism. And other times the music is much, doing much more than, than what the uh, door slam is, you know. For one thing, it was, a, it was a family film. It was a very friendly film about a family who had these pets. And the pets were really important to the family. They were all identified with kids. And the pets got along okay, but they really liked being part of the family, you know. So you have this kind of bond that's there between the family and between the pets. Most of the story has to do with the pets trying to get back because they think they've been deserted, trying to get back to the family. These two dogs and a cat actually make it back to wherever the family is. And they encounter cougars and they encounter bears and they encounter, you know, all this terrible stuff in rivers and, and human beings trying to catch them and all that kind of stuff. Um, so there's, again, this very strong bond in it. And so I, I had a feeling that it had to be something sort of big and substantial, you know, so I, I had that tune. thing so you really feel the mountains you feel the sky you feel the hope you feel the uh, all this emotional stuff you know so I had to have a really big theme and it was a very traditional kind of melody there was no, there was nothing pop about it a lot of mm -hmm. people saw this one and um, and then their kids see it so they're always I, I even have a video somewhere I got online uh, of a little dog a little pug dog watching the scene at the end where the animals all return and it's hysterical because this dog is actually watching the scene and and when Shadow, the old dog, doesn't come back, 
The dog gets down, he gets to look at his oh. <laughs> And then when the music starts to get big, it's like, oh, here comes Shadow. The dog gets up and he starts racing around the room barking. And, you know, I mean, it's really, <laughs> I mean, gee, even the animals get this one, you know. But anyway, it's, it's cool to do something like that. Well, you know, that movie was different because for one thing, it wasn't out in the country. And um, like the, the original Homeward Bound had, for chance, there was sort of a country uh, fiddle kind of thing that I could use for that. It, it was harder to pull off in the San Francisco thing. But when he met Delilah, even though they're just two dogs, she either had a sexy voice or something. But and, you know, I, I bought the whole idea of the romance because, you know, the, the actors did it really well. and. Um, and I thought, okay, we're not in the country. We're in San Francisco, which is, you know, pretty cool place. So I just did it much more uh, pop-like, you know, with guitars and, and uh, saxophone. And, um, you know, it's just done a lot more commercial. It was still pretty conservative, given what the movie was and who was going to see it. But it was something that I would have no use for in the first movie because there was nothing like that. You know, they were always out in the country getting attacked by big animals. Here they were getting attacked by, by street animals. And um, mm -hmm. it was just a little bit different, you know. Again, you know, I do this by feeling. There, there's a thing in music called harmonic rhythm. And what that is, is how often the chords change, how often the, the chords move. That's one of those things that, that gives the effect of a, of a song this or that, you know, is that do you stay on the same chord for a long time and move the melody around or do you move the chord, you know, fast and, you know, all this stuff. Um, you know, those are the considerations that I have to make for something like Delilah. Am I going to make the, am I going to make the tune really busy? If I'm going to make the tune a little bit more commercial and a little um, kind of sexy, how am I going to use the chords so that I'm going to be able to support the tune and more than that, support the idea of this little doggy date. It's like when you're writing a melody. The question always is, what's the next note? When you're writing a tune, the next note is always, it's always a good question. What are you going to write? And sometimes I listen to songs written by other people, other tunes, and sometimes my tunes too. You know, you sit there and you listen to it and you go, that really wasn't a very good choice. It's too bad because the beginning of this is much more interesting than that part. Whoever wrote this didn't work hard enough on that part. Or sometimes when I'm working on a tune, I'm saying, in fact, one time I was working on, on a melody and my daughter was at home. And I said, listen to this, listen to this tune that I'm working on. I said, what do you think about that? And she said, the middle's kind of boring. And I thought, rats, she heard it. <laughs> because it was, so I had to fix it, you know, because she's just telling me the truth. The middle's kind of boring. Now, she doesn't know whether it's because I went up or down or changed the chord or, you know, what, but you know, she was right. I needed to do something more distinctive. You just write it until it feels right. Sometimes the tunes come pretty fast. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes you really have to work on them. The thing that's interesting about movies and this kind of music is that you use um, all these things you learn in school or learn when you're studying music. You learn about counterpoint theory, uh, chord structure, bass lines, and blah, 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 all this kind of stuff. And then you use it for a very specific purpose. Like, I'm going to use all these tunes, but I need to make people laugh. So maybe say so it can be harmonized this way, but if I harmonize it this way, it's kind of funny, you know? Or if I put a chord right, whoop, right there, that's kind of kinky and kind of weird, you know? And maybe that's gonna be really good for this theme because I'm trying to express something that's kind of kinky and weird. So it's just your personal style. What makes you think is gonna be effective to tell the story in the way that you're doing it? I just finished a piece for band, um, or I, I'm just finishing up a piece of band. It's a big suite based on the Grimm's fairy tales. So I have like, I've picked five of them and I've, I've put them into music. It's sort of like movie cues in that they're descriptive of what's supposed to go on. You know, like one of them is um, Red Riding Hood. And mm -hmm. the, the big bad, I mean, everybody knows that, you know, knows the story, so they should be able to follow the piece pretty well. But the, the wolf is played by the saxophone section. So when the saxophones play, you go, oh, that's the wolf, you know, and there's a, I mean, things like that. So I'm sort of taking my movie background and putting it into a piece. 
I've never known too far ahead what I was going to be doing. It's been more fun that way, you know. Well, for me, it's how good the music is, frankly. I mean, just as music, um, how skilled it is, <clears throat> how well it's written, how good the themes are, how good it is dramatically. I could probably think of a whole bunch of scores that I think are really terrific, but there was one I was listening to a little bit yesterday, which was the, um, which was a cue from the movie uh, Basic Instinct by Jerry Goldsmith. And there's a, um, there's a chase in it that's like a typical Jerry chase. But in that, he has little pieces of the theme, which is done with two clarinets. And it's really weird the way it works, because you're, it's like, it's a chase, and it's like what he would do for a chase, and what a lot of people would do for a chase. But in that, is it's not just a chase for any movie, it's a chase for this movie. It refers to this character, you know, and just, it was very, very clever. And I, I would admire that a lot. There's another one that is really an old movie, really an old, you've probably never seen it. It's an old movie by John Williams called, uh, the, called The Reavers. It was done probably about 50 years ago, you know. It's a really cool, it's a good movie, but it's a really cool score. It, it's got a lot of banjo and, and, I mean, you'd never think of it as being John Williams, the guy who wrote Star Wars and all that kind of stuff, because you know, he has lots of styles he writes. But this one's really, it's very melodic and it's very, um, it's very bouncy and, and it's very well written and, and um, it's just fun, you know, it kind of makes you laugh when you hear this thing. So sometimes the music lasts better than the movies. I like to hear something that just makes me feel good. My favorite of the movie composers is Jerry Goldsmith. So I, I listen to a lot of his, well, not a lot of them, but I, some of his I think are really amazing. Um, there's one that he wrote for Chinatown, which has this drop dead beautiful tune, but the score is so well put together with so much craft and so much, I mean, there's a lot of strange music in it and, and this uh, 1940s kind of tune, which isn't really a 1940s kind of a tune. And I mean, everything about it is just great. Like Basic Instinct, I remember calling him after that and saying, wow, I just saw this movie. Boy, you did a great job on stuff. Well, How to Train Your Dragon, I really like that score. The score is Spartacus, the old, you know, the old movie with Kirk Douglas and all that. Oh, the score to, uh, in fact, I just saw him last night, the composer of The Matrix. A lot of Henry Mancini things uh, were really cool. Even like Back to the Future, I like that. You know, that's an old school, but I, I like that whole stuff. Oh, there was a score I did like, uh, which is a, from a few years ago. The composer died, unfortunately, called um, Arrival, about the spaceship that comes in and it sort of sits there and waits. Yeah, yeah. That score was done by Johan Johansson, and uh, it was sort of a sound design score. I thought it was really cool. I thought it was really effective. I like the ones that are really well thought out and, and really put together well. Uh, Bruce, thank you so much for um, coming on to the show. Yeah. Um, honestly, you're one of my favorite composers. So oh, being able nice. to do this is awesome.